You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Accounted For. Happy Wednesday, everyone. This is the podcast on a mission to expand your perspectives, have you question the status quo, and get you inspired to action for your own career. The podcast is part of OMD Ventures, the ecosystem I'm creating to inspire high performers to challenge conventions. If you are a long-time listener, you, you'll probably understand, you're probably realizing that the tagline for OMD Ventures has been evolving, and I think that's just the fact that I'm currently in the process of evolving as well. And so because of that, I'm constantly trying to narrow down what I'm trying to do with the platform as well as the kind of direction I'm trying to take. And I guess that's just part of what it means to go on this quote-unquote pathless journey. And so today's episode is uh, definitely, it's a different one. It's kind of more of a special. It's episode 53, which means that I've had 52 episodes of talking to other people. Okay, technically 51, because one of them was talking to myself, just talking about the journey that I've had because some listeners started um, being curious about that but it's still 52 episodes out and I thought why not celebrate the one year milestone you know weekly podcast 52 episodes that's 52 conversations I know I kind of cheated and I think a few weeks back when I went on my retreat for uh, the quarter that was my Q2 retreat I I took two weeks off and I decided hmm, why don't I just replay, do a replay of two very popular um, episodes, and I think that's something I might continuously uh, experiment with because yeah, like sometimes people miss out on pretty cool content, and it would be really cool for you know newer listeners to get a chance to listen to the old episodes that people continue to find value in. But yeah, so today's episodes. More, more of a fun one, kind of more free form. Um, like I'm literally holding the mic in my hand instead of using a mic stand to just kind of keep it more casual. So this might not be as interesting for people who are, you know, regular listeners on the podcast who want to listen to someone else's story. This will be more talking about just the learnings and experiences I've had of actually building this podcast out over the year. Um, and so yeah, if this is it insightful for you then that's amazing if it's not then you know probably should turn it off <laughs> and listen to some other amazing podcasts or like a past episode of accounted for but yeah so i hope this adds some kind of value to you i'm hoping it's going to add value to me because i'm i'm going to be using this hour as a way for me to just reflect on what's happened and i think um a common experience I like to talk about very often with people is the early days when I decided to start the podcast. So I I had ideas for the podcast for a while. Um, well, I had ideas of doing the podcast, doing some kind of podcast a few years back. I always wanted to do one. Been a big fan since you know, 2014. And even then podcasts were still relatively new most of my friends didn't listen to podcasts back then and you know in hindsight doing it earlier would have been much cooler (laughs) but i think you know things things take time for a reason and i think there's no such thing as wasted time and so yeah when i decided to you know think seriously about the starting a podcast last year it was it was probably in march like i start i thought about it in march and I didn't end up launching until August, August of that year. So August of last year, yeah. It's true, yeah, it's actually literally been close to a year. And I honestly like built, like I had, I had, I started collecting episodes. I started building things out and that all happened over the summer. Like I did it, I think I had my first interview recorded sometime in May. Like I was going around pitching the idea of a podcast to people in my immediate network that I thought had interesting stories and 
really ask them to just kind of give me some of their time and also the trust that I'm just doing this project. And luckily, I had a lot of great people around me that wanted to share their story and also help me out. It was really more of a favor to me, really, I think. Like, they didn't really expect this to really go anywhere. Well, I don't think they would have because you know, it's just a project. That's how I framed it as. I don't really frame it as this is going to be a company or anything. That was never the intent. It was just the whole purpose was to really test out one singular hypothesis, which was, do I really enjoy having in-depth conversations with people, even if it's not for an investing role? Because when I was an investor, that was the big thing that I had fun with, just interviewing CEOs. And I just wanted to find a way to continue doing that. And this was just kind of one of those ways to validate this initial hypothesis that you know, I think I hit flow state when I have interesting in-depth conversations with people. And, you know, I think after doing at least half a year of it, it was very true. Um, I very much do look forward to doing these podcasts. And, you know, I'll go, I'll go into a little more in-depth on what, what kind of conversations I found to be much more exciting. But for for the most part, it's something that I've been looking forward to doing and when I started doing it it, started, it continued to get exciting um, I think though what I didn't expect was like all the operational stuff that would make it tedious <laughs> that I would not really enjoy like I think parts of it were cool like the initial building parts were really cool like when I would ask a friend to help design the album art for the podcast how I'm going through all kinds of music labels to figure out the opening song and also just learning about music licenses to figure out can i use this can i not use this and there's there's some i forgot the name of it but there are unique laws that allow you to use certain kinds of music for your podcast or any kind of production as long as you give credit and so you don't have to pay them and so these kinds of songs are under some kind of separate legal um, licensing agreement so those are things i would learn about um and then, yeah, like learning about all these platforms like Google Play, Apple, and all that. I mean, when when I first launched the podcast, it was totally stressful because I was, you know, watching how-to videos, learning from all these other podcasters on what is the optimal best way to launch a podcast. And you want to launch with three to four episodes already in the bank. So when you launch on opening day, you have three three to four episodes already so that people look at it and they can listen to a couple and get hooked on by the first couple and they also talk about how you know you want to set up a landing page get people excited i didn't do any of that <laughs> i don't you know i mean in hindsight maybe i should have but at the same time yeah i don't know i'm i don't know this just this just never really crossed my mind as something i wanted to spend my time doing then i, I think when i asked the ultimate question of would this stop the project from being fun the answer was yes i think for me it it was always like more of a focus of just doing it just getting it done instead of trying to do it quote unquote the right way because there really isn't a right way um but yeah like yeah so launching the podcast and uh, like i remember on the day i decided to launch like i told everyone i told all the people that I had interviewed that the podcast is going to launch on, I think it was a particular Wednesday, and it's going to go live then. Look out for it. I'll send you emails. And I was telling all my friends, close friends, about the podcast coming live on Wednesday. And lo and behold, I think a few weeks before I set all this stuff up, because you can schedule it ahead of time, and you really have to do it. It's better to do it ahead of time because you have to get approved for a first time podcast by like Apple and Google and Stitcher and all these platforms. Like they have to go through your stuff and they have to make sure that you're fitting all these criteria and constraints. Like I think my image got caught. My album art got rejected once because it didn't fit the dimensions. And so I had to get it fixed one, one time from my designer friend. And yeah, like, I remember Google Play was seamless. It happened easily. But Apple's podcasts, like, the iTunes Connect uh, platform was down. <laughs> and everyone on the Apple's Apple uh, message board was freaking out. And that's, I think that's when I also realized how many people start podcasts every day. 
like it was, the message board was was piled with people who wanted to start podcasts, and they were all freaking out because they had all worked to set up this launch date, and made me think, wow, there's a ton of people out there who are doing exactly what I'm doing, that have had similar experiences, and definitely made me realize that this is not a special thing or not not even a big thing. Um, that the barrier to entry was extremely low, and it's getting lower every day. I think with more companies making it easier and easier and easier pe- to people. Which is debatable whether it's good or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember I was freaking out, and God, just just really hated Apple then. <laughs> like I still use a lot of Apple products, but God, I hated that it's shitty their platform was. I think they've improved it a lot now. That's what I'm understanding. Like I got all these email updates from Apple saying, "Oh, our podcast stuff is updating, and we're improving categories." Blah blah blah. But yeah, it was it was stressful then. Um, I'm I'd be posting on Apple message boards constantly, eat, trying to find a way to contact customer service, and that's the thing. That's when I also learned that Apple had really shitty customer service, <laughs> like not in terms of the hardware, but the actual software for people who are building stuff for them for their platform. It it seemed so archaic when I was there. Like the fact that we were still using message boards and forums to handle all these issues and wait to hear back from someone to talk about this. Whereas when you actually go to an Apple store, you get this streamlined, beautiful, you know, kind of like even like white glove level service. So that was very surprising. Um, and I think that's, and that's not even that much different with Google Play. The Google Play is the same thing as well because I had issues with the analytics. And so I would reach out to them and it's the same thing. It, seemed, it just seems so old the way the services run. It just seems so inefficient compared to the front facing parts of their whole operation that we use every day. But yeah, like that was, that was like the early parts of the operation that really I, you know, I got stressed by. But at the same time, it made me really realize that, God, could I, I, I can't imagine really doing this with somebody else. <laughs> like, even if you paid me, I don't think I would enjoy it. That's when it really hit me. Because, so as I've been doing these podcasts, I've had companies ask me, or people from companies ask me, hey, can you come and kind of consult us and you know, I just go in for free and I say, hey, you know, what kind of questions you have? And I was just happy that people were giving me attention and wanting to talk to me. And I figured this could also help me figure myself out on my own journey. And a lot of the times they would tell me, oh, yeah, we want to start our own podcast. So how do we start? And they would just practically use me as a way to just download all the information instead of them having to go out and research. And, you know, I was maybe I'm really naive in that way. But, you know, I figured, yeah. Like, all this is free, and sure, I invested time to doing this, but a lot of my podcast guests come on for free. I mean, everyone comes on for free, so if I can help other people out, why not? So, yeah, like, I'll tell people about exactly how I started the podcast and all the operational hiccups I've had, the learnings I've had, and then we'll kind of conclude with, so do do you want to come and build this out for us? And (laughs) a lot of the times, it's not exciting for me. Like, I'll think about it and go, hmm, no, it's all right. Like, I I know how annoying it is to go through the operations. And so a part of me just immediately just, my immediate gut reaction is to just reject it. Um, but I think that was, that has been a very valuable experience for me in just the whole operation side of building this media platform. Because right now I have more than the podcast, right? I have the newsletter, I have the essays, and I'm pumping out at least three pieces of what I want to be quality content every week. And it's not something that just comes out willy-nilly. Like, it takes a lot of work to prepare. And, yeah, so I think that's definitely been a big learning where through this I realized not only do I love talking to people, but that I really, I really need to be convinced by the person that I'd be working with or some kind of mission or the specificity specificity of the operations that i'd be doing like it has to align with what i want to do for me to actually do it if not i definitely won't be able to do it because i'm also like not the kind of person who can do things i think half-assed um i definitely did learn that like i get frustrated very quickly as well like that's another thing on this journey people have been you know giving me did first ask me oh dan are you so how are you monetizing this i for the longest time the answer was i'm not monetizing it like now i am 
in a very minor way through donations thanks to you listeners who are still hanging on to uh this episode hopefully this doesn't bore you but yeah before the, the donation stuff launched why I, I made nothing on the podcast like, absolutely nothing um like i didn't get like i earned my single dollar through medium in january of 2019 through my essays and that's because like medium told me i can get paid if i didn't know that i wouldn't have um, applied for the program but you know it's nothing to sustain myself over and then people you know start giving you unsolicited advice because they want to think like they're helping <laughs> but you know the people will say oh why don't you take on this job blah, blah, blah. and i and i that's also something it's funny like it's ironic i tell people that the same thing too i tell people don't do what i did don't you know leave the corporate world and just jump into this unknown uh at first like i just recommend people not do that because i know how challenging and difficult and gut-wrenching it is um not even from a logistical standpoint but just from a completely emotional standpoint and but yeah like i like i i did you know i wanted to take my own advice i you know i applied to jobs i i thought about trying to figure out a way to um earn income while doing this and in, in the early offsets like it was i think probably late last year early this year it was kind of about oh you know what if you know like maybe yeah maybe i can kind of moonlight to the podcast on the side have some kind of income method that you know it's easy for me to do like leverage my finance background and a lot of the times yeah like i just i just couldn't sell myself on it and i think that's a big thing like i'm this should be true for most people, but it's that it's just so hard to sell something that you just don't truly believe in. It's one thing to be rejected selling something you believe in, but I think it's a whole different game when you're trying to sell something that you don't even believe in, and then you get rejected. And even if you get, and even if you sell it, you, I think it feels, it doesn't feel great at all. It doesn't even feel as good as being rejected from trying to sell something you actually want to sell, because once they accept it, then this kind of dread comes on this feeling of oh, i don't even, i didn't even want to sell this but now they bought it and there's kind of this guilt and this negative emotion that overcomes you as well like at least for me um god how did i get off on this tangent <laughs> i kind of have I, I i did write out point form show notes so that i stay on track because I, ha- I have a tendency to just go off on tangents whenever someone asks me for advice and i know none of you asked for any of this but <laughs> i'm just trying to share my learnings and i ended up just going on this weird tangent but i guess that's how most of my podcasts go anyway so it shouldn't be anything new for you guys <laughs> um what was it oh yeah so the main one was that i was talking about operations and how yeah like it's definitely helped me figure out that I really can't give two shits about other people's operations if I really don't care about it myself. If I'm not somehow invested in it, like, you know, if I was to help somebody else start a podcast and I really don't give a shit about their company, what they do, and it's just even the nature of setting up a podcast. It's not something that excites me. It's not something that's fun for me. And fortunately, I'm not in a situation where I just really need money to pay the bills, so that's given me the luxury to just constantly say no to all those things but it was very valuable learning that and i wouldn't have known that unless i went through all this by myself and another thing with operations is just the constant guest managing like it's hard and you know i think it's it goes without saying that having a guest every week is a difficult thing to do because you know you, you need agreement from both parties and that's just one other entire different variable that you have no control over. And, oh man, I remember when I was launching the podcast, I, I think I had seven or eight episodes banked up in inventory. Like I had recorded seven or eight episodes and I was ready to launch and I would launch with three in the beginning. And then I gave myself about a month, a month buffer. And I also used that time to just kind of travel to New York and just kind of have a staycation in New York. And I, so the podcast went live and it was i think i was supposed to launch episode number seven or i was i was 
episode number seven, the last one, was supposed to launch in two weeks. And I was just having it all set up ahead of time because I think I was going to be in New York for about five days. And I figured, why not? Let's just do some work. And the person who was supposed to be episode seven emailed me back. And so this is this is in like September, I think. And said, oh, I think this is going to be... You know, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you don't send it out. And... I was so infuriated. It it just really upset me. Um, because the person knew this was going to go out. Like, I, I had finished editing everything months ahead. And I had constantly asked them, it's going to go live sometime in August. And for later episodes, it's going to go live sometime in September. Be okay with this. If there's something wrong, please let me know. Because I was starting out too. Like, I wanted to work with people and make it a seamless process and this was my learning process as well like if you know certain things the editing wasn't up to par up to key like i wanted to fix that before i had my big launch so everyone had all these episodes months in advance i gave them plenty of notice i sent follow-up emails and then at the very like two weeks before launch i i sent a final follow-up email saying hey you know i didn't hear back from you but i hope everything's okay with all the other episodes it was like that people just they don't reply back because everyone's busy. But this particular person replied back and said, Yeah, you know, I, th- I thought about it. I kind of ignored your past emails. But now that I think about it, I don't want you to put it out. And it was such a slap in the face. And it was just so inconsiderate. And obviously, it's all from my perspective, right? But, you know, it's also, I guess, that kind of perceived fear that people think that they actually are so important and matter. Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely probably sound very jaded here, but I, I'm just trying to rekindle the old emotions. And yeah, like it really bothered me. It really bothered me because my experience, like my own experience with me being honest and very upfront about my career and stuff has been that it doesn't matter. The There is really close to no downside with being extremely vulnerable and extremely honest about things. And I think that's something I learned. And it's always funny when I think, of how people are so afraid of that because when you actually go through it you realize that it really wasn't that important because you only think it's important because you think you're that important and you matter but you really don't no one really cares about you and if you're especially an employee you're just so replaceable that it doesn't even matter but if you're vulnerable and honest you can actually impact so many more lives and help people see things that they are they might see in the future or they might also experience um in the future as well and they can be well prepared for it but yeah like that's i think that was definitely a big learning um it definitely was frustrating but yeah like since since then though i (laughs) i make sure that the episode can go out like i when i talk to people i I tell them like this is going out like once i record it I have full ownership of this and it's going out. Um, I don't even really let people edit it much anymore. And that's also been a learning process where people will say, oh, can you edit this so that my like I sound better? I'm like, no, I'm not. That's It's just a conversation. We're just putting out a conversation. It's not really to make you look good. It's so you can help other people. Um, and you speaking eloquently, maybe it might touch a person but that's not the point it's the story that's being told and it's how you can touch someone else through your story and so yeah like those are those are things that i ended up like realizing and going through like and at the end of the day it it just constantly went on the theme of is this fun if it's not fun then i can't do it and if there are parts of the process that are making it not fun that are making it stressful then i'll try to cut it out and that's that includes like making things pretty like touching upon the i think i talked about it earlier is like feedback the un- unsolicited feedback and advice people love to give like you know i love it when listeners write in and tell me about how yeah like it's been really helpful and they like to point out what they like i think that's the thing. i enjoy hearing about what they like like what makes it this podcast special because i can double down on that and sometimes you know, they also share oh like if this was more like this or if this was shorter it would be better or um like if you can cut things up to tidbits that'd be nicer and 
when I hear about it, you know, in, in the beginning, I think I got very upset about it because it was very personal. Um, because I didn't realize, like, when when you, when I tried putting myself in the other person's shoes, it's not a big deal. Like this person meant no malice. This person was trying, you know, had good intentions, and usually most of the time they just want to help, right? Because they 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 feel like I think they can help, um, and obviously a part of me thinks there is also like that deeper rooted sense of you know feeling like they are of some importance enough to tell me something that they think I pro- I haven't considered or don't know about. So there, there is that element where it also makes me question, have you really thought about the value you would add by saying that? Do you really think I wouldn't have thought about it if I'm doing this for way more hours than you are? If you've never been in this space, do you not think I've thought about that? Um, God, I'm going, I'm going down that negative route again. <laughs> but um, yeah, like so the, I, know, I know it comes from a good place. I know the intent comes from a good place for sure. But in the beginning, I remember it was just so hard to take that advice because I would get so upset by it because then you know I would I would explode on my girlfriend like I wouldn't get mad at her but I, I would be upset and I'd tell her about it and bless her heart for being such a great listener because yeah I would tell them like do do these, do these people not understand how hard it is for me to just go through all this stuff like how challenging it is to put myself out there and I think that's the thing like. The criticisms that come with it um you know I, I don't get much hate mail like i think i've had maybe you know but i i i have gotten it before you know i've had people email in and tell me how you know like, i'm a fraud and like i'm not gonna go anywhere and all, all my achievements are a scam and oh yeah like i've i've had people write in <laughs> with that kind of stuff and i remember in the beginning i was saying oh god that hurt and then later on i was saying nice that means I'm somebody. If I'm, if people are upset by what I'm doing, that means I'm doing something. So that was also very good, and because I told, like, I was very proud of that. I would tell my friends about it, and then my friends were very, very happy for me too. They would say, "Oh my god, I can't believe you got hate mail. That's amazing. That means you're, you're saying something meaningful." I was like, "Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm saying something meaningful." So that was, that was really cool. But yeah, like, the day to day though, I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to make this better and. You know, people constantly talk about, oh, like you want to iterate, you want to make things better, and but at the end of the day, it's still it's still like your baby, and whenever you get feedback, like, oh, like this part sucks, this part should be better. I think in the beginning it was hard to handle it. I think over time it got much easier because I started realizing that all these unsolicited unsolicited, unsolicited advice are mainly opinions, and sometimes these are people who are not even diehard fans. Some are diehard fans and then those are the people that I want to cater to because they've constantly interacted with me and they've constantly interacted with the podcast and they have very thoughtful comments, which I really value. But a lot of the times, you're also just people who've listened to like one episode and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, it was, it was too long for me. I just want it to be a 20-minute thing. And nowadays, I, when people say that, I just respond, then it's not for you. You don't have to listen to it. I really don't need you as a listener if you don't want long-form content. Like If you wanted a quick fix and quick answer, there's so many other places to do that. Like, I quit Instagram and I don't have Twitter and all that because I I don't like all that short form content. I like long form. That's why I'm doing it long form. And that actually talks goes to the point of I actually fin- find one hour to be way too short. <laughs> like I'm so jealous of Joe Rogan because he gets to do three hour podcasts. Like he's earned the trust of people enough to I think get three hours of their time. Like. Even me asking for one hour of people's time, I find it's a big ask. Um, But honestly, in the future, I really do hope to have longer podcasts. Like, I really enjoy having long conversations. And I really find that even an hour isn't really enough to get someone's story out in a really deep and meaningful way. And that's something I'm constantly working on. I think that's definitely an art. the, The art of questioning. Um trying to really dig deeper into the unconscious of the person and trying to pull out a story that really impacted them but they don't even realize it because i think you know i think i can only count on on the 
I don't know, like 10 fingers, the number of times that has actually happened. And the reason I think it happened is because they would tell me after the podcast that, wow, I never thought about my life in this way before. And I learned something more about myself today than um, before. And I think those those are like immediate gratification, but it really leaves a lasting impact for me. Um, yeah, there, there are times when I would do an episode, we would record, and after the interview, when the person gets emotional, when they tell me that I ask questions that they had never asked themselves before, that never that they had never even considered, and it like you see a spark in their eyes, and they came up with answers that they had never had. Like and they even they were able to connect their lives in a very purposeful way like it's like as if they intentionally did all these things in the past like they're seeing a connection now and when i see that i definitely get extremely overjoyed and i think those that's one of the one of the things that really gratifies me um make, makes me really excited when i do the podcast like i i kind of look for that like i want that to be a result when i interview someone when with doing the podcast i want to help you know the thousands of listeners i have that you know i want to help them really challenge conventions be able to think differently really expand their perspectives and have them live a life that they want that will be different from what the norm requires and that that would be a wonderful end result but in the immediate short term like if i go to each interview i think i started chasing that i started chasing that effect that I want to have to the interviewee. I want to be the kind of person that asks some questions that they never thought about asking. I want to, I want the hour to be an hour where they start really looking into themselves and realizing something different. And, you know, like, to, I think to do that effectively, I think I need more than one hour. Um, I know I'm kind of blaming time, but... I think the time factor would help and but yeah it's also for me like I think it's been a journey of learning to ask better questions learning learning to go deeper and it's it's constantly a challenge I you know I will said feedback from other listeners who said you know maybe you should go deeper into topics because I don't think you go deep enough and I'll tell them do you have any idea how hard it is to actually dig through stories and trying to also showcase other parts of the story of that person to create some kind of arc while doing it within a one hour time frame while trying to make sure the person's comfortable because people don't also realize that the guests are not some are great speakers some are amazing public speakers and they can tell a story so eloquently and they've also told this story many times so sometimes it gets easier though, but some guests they are extremely shy and like i've had interviews where I can see the guest shaking, like their their hand is shaking as they are talking, and I can sense their nervousness. And so then I, then that's when I try to really calm them down. And that's, I think that's also something I'm learning about and learning about how to do well in terms of helping the guests feel comfortable, comfortable enough to trust me in this really short amount of time. Like they don't know me. But trusting me enough to share their story with me as well as with my audience. And I find that's also very tough. And it's definitely an art that I'm not sure how to master except by just constantly doing <laughs> and just seeing and testing things out constantly and just being cognizant of what worked, what didn't. And it's also like a very live thing. Like I ask certain questions to like quote-unquote easy ball questions to get them feel comfortable and i can see them relax and they start smiling and it starts feeling like a normal conversation some people get there quickly some people get there later some people sometimes never do sometimes I've ha- i'll have like a fully nervous person at the end of the table um and it'll just be a, that kind of interview and it's, it's it's at those points when i as an interviewer sometimes think that i might have failed and or some some other times when I think I failed or like when I don't feel like I went deep enough like I come out of the interview and I go damn I 
I really don't think I really impacted that per- that interviewee's life as much. And by consequence, I don't think that interview would hit hard hit hard enough to enough people listening to make an impact in their lives because I think it's a trickle effect. I think if I can really have an amazing interview with an interviewee where that person really feels something, that will carry over through the con- like through that conversation to the listeners as well. And so there are definitely like those moments when I, I equate kind of a, a bad interview, like my, my own failings as an interviewer with the state of the interviewee during and, and close to the end of the interview, as well as the kind of effect um, that lack that that seems lacking from the conversation, but yeah, like I've also had interviewees who we've done a podcast with the person's eyes closed, <laughs> so so the person could calm down, and yeah, I think that's definitely a different art that I've become much more aware of, because now I'm just interviewing so many different kinds of people. It's not just people who are, you know, these high achieving type A kids who go to business school. That was my entire world. Sure, I went to accounting, consulting, and investing. And don't get me wrong. All people in those three different fields are very different. The personas are very different. The outside world might know it, but might not know it. But they are definitely very different personas that go to those kinds of fields. But even then, like now, I'm talking to people who are in medical fields, in technological fields, and yeah, it's all very different. Even in entre- even entrepreneurs, they're all very different. They're not all this big risk-taking kind of persona. They all have unique quirks about them. Um, okay, I'm going to try to go back to the, the discussion points that I had. Wow, it's already been like 36 minutes. Nice. I was kind of worried that I wouldn't have enough to talk about, but I think as I start talking, it just kind of opens up. And I think that's a natural thing for me. I just love talking, so I also want more time to talk to people. Um... Let's see, I kind of like bitched about a lot of things that upset me. <laughs> but, uh, what else? No, I think this was like the, like the normal thing. Like I talked about how everyone's very different. Like, I, But I think I've, I've also learned that through interviewing so many people that everyone is also extremely normal. Like on the outside, some people might seem smarter. Some people might seem more put together, more quirky. That's how they achieved X, Y, Z, like, based on what the media t- says. But when you, when I should meet the person, chat off camera, uh, chat off air, even chatting on the podcast, they live very normal lives. They're very normal people that had normal upbringings, like on, on the most general sense. And you know, they have special strengths and pieces about them. But most of the time, it's just, yeah, like, they're very normal. And I think that was also a big thing where it puts things into perspective that, okay, well, these people had all these fascinating journeys, but they're not too farly different from me. So that means I'll probably go through some kind of weird thing with my life as well. And that's also when I start learning to really dig into people's lives because that's how we can also determine the substance, whether they have it or not, in terms of, you know, when they do it when they achieve some kind of feat how much of it is you know with intent um compared to just co- complete luck but at the same time even if it happened with luck like can they continuously consistently execute on things instead of just having a couple lucky breaks and i think i'm also learning to ask questions to really uncover that and so that's also a separate art in itself as well i haven't really found an answer to that it's just Right now, the solution has been just continue digging. Constantly asking the what question over the why question. Because why, if you ask why, people will always rationalize. They'll rationalize why they did X, Y, Z. And I think the only time why might be effective is when you're asking someone about the future. Why do you want to achieve like, you know, this goal for the future? But when referring to something they've done in the past, then I try to stick it to the what or the how, where if I do how, then they can kind of take me through the steps that they actually went through the process. And then when they go through the process and I can ask them what to ask to kind of get into 
their mindset then and what what made them do x what made them think a certain way what drove them to do this kind of how uh, i think those are things i've definitely learned in terms of actually asking questions because it can bring about different answers and go down different rabbit holes um and i think I'm, like on the outset like i the whole podcast is about you know finding the non-linearity in journeys that seem linear or even just exploring journeys that look non-linear in general as well and the funny thing is that some some of my most favorite interviews have been people who have had journeys that i considered to be very linear and then it's it's just it might just be how they tell stories or um just the way they think through things but yeah, or sometimes it's just that it looks linear but maybe i just love it because i'm just so completely surprised that oh my god i didn't know you went through all this kind of stuff in this journey that looked so obvious and it's unfair to assume that because i hate it when people assume that about my journey because everyone thinks it's so linear when I, i'd say you know i would definitely argue that i've had an extremely non-linear journey um but yeah i i find that that a lot of my favorite podcast interviews have been people like non-linear journeys and there's also this kind of persona too of certain kinds of people i find have a certain way of thinking that i am biased towards in terms of liking so i've noticed that i enjoy talking with people who are ex-lawyers and investors i think i think it's it's common knowledge based on like my writings and stuff i also say on podcasts that i i personally cur- currently still think that people in the investing world are probably by far the smartest people i've met um like i just enjoy talking with I don't really get to have those kinds of intellectually stimulating discussions where, you know, you go to you go to drink a beer and all you talk about with your colleagues are a lot of theoretical. You you go through philosophy, religion, and then you go into physics and science, like the and the application of technology. Like you go through all of that while drinking a beer in the afternoon. I've never had those kinds of conversations in other fields <laughs> that I've been in, and. So that's why I definitely have a bias towards enjoying talking to investors. And I've been surprised by the fact that I enjoy talking to lawyers. I, I don't know if the training that they've had, but I found the lawyers I've had the chance to interview and speak with to have a very structured way of thinking. Like they're very analytical. in, And I'm trying to take out all the dirty meaning behind analytical that all these consulting firms use because... Oh, it's just that word has been so used up that it's, it just feels so dirty to say it nowadays. But that's how I would describe their thinking. It's just in the most honest to God way. It's just very analytical. Um, and there's this kind of process and thoughtfulness to the words that they say. Like it's like each word that they choose to say is very purposeful, and you feel it in the conversations. And I think that that's something i did notice and it's not just been one person that's why i say that i, I i've generalized it now <laughs> into a group although i don't know that many lawyers but i would say like out of the like maybe five <laughs> i've spoken with that's that's a trait i'm noticing um yeah but yeah like i this this has also been a really fun journey and i like because I realized how much I love talking to people, I constantly, I constantly ideate, ideate about starting different podcasts. Like, I think my idea bank has at least ten different podcast ideas, and I'm kind of thankful I didn't execute on them, um, because I think a lot of them are now merging into this singular podcast. Like, I'm just picking the best parts, best ideas, and merging it to another podcast. And that's actually one thing. I'm. I might start another podcast. Like I talked about it in my newsletters. But I think I'm getting closer to deciding on starting one. And I think it's, like I want to combine a lot of elements, like elements of investing, elements of org design, like designing utopian companies, and also an element to just kind of document what i go through on a week to week like i i experimented with that with a vlog with called the boring life and it was fun until it didn't become fun anymore but 
I started because people were curious. I, you know, I've had listeners reach out and say, you know, I enjoyed your Christmas special, learning about your life, but I would like to learn more about what you're going through constantly. And so I might start one where it, I have a podcast that incorporates all those themes. And it's, it might also be a good way for me to constantly reflect every week as well. So that's something I'm constantly thinking about. And even for this podcast, I think I'm constantly thinking about ways to make it better for the future and integrating more things into it as it goes on. Like, I want to interact more with you, the listeners. And so I'm, I've am i been constantly having ideas about having some kind of AMA, Q&A form. Like, that's what I created the donation thing for as well. And for, for you donated, I'm sorry, I haven't really executed on that. I, I've kind of left you in the dark with all these promises, but I, you know, I am going to get to it. And I'm trying to incorporate that in some way where, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like um, some kind of barrier form of content where if you are a donation a donator, then you have access to all these separate podcast episodes that are going to be AMAs where you just ask me things and I can tell you. And it's you know, for people that buy me coffee <laughs> so that they get added value some, somehow um, because now it, it gets harder for me to go meet people for coffee as well because my time is getting even more strapped as the platform grows as well as i'm trying to do more of the work that i'm that i want to do where i can design companies of the future and so because of that i i find it's harder to interact with my listeners but it's something i want to constantly do because that's how that's why i started it to help people and if i can find a way to do that in a more scalable way that'd be definitely very helpful um So yeah, that kind of AMA style is definitely on the table to incorporate into the podcast, even as like a half episode. Um, And another thing I want to try to incorporate maybe is like kind of like a live case case study thing where, you know, I, I, I ran a introspective coaching program last year and I've had people constantly, um, reach out and wanting to kind of take some part of that i created the service so people can sign up and pay me to do that but i also realized that it's quite a big financial investment for most people um to have that much of my time but i also feel that um people can benefit just by listening to other people getting um their stories examined just by you know just just through being on that journey with me constantly questioning a particular person about their behavior, their past, and helping them pull out stories. So I might have something like that where you know, if there's a if there are brave souls who want to, you know, remain anonymous but still share deep truths about them and deep parts of the stories publicly, for again maybe it'll be under a paywall and only for people that donate coffees to me, um, but still a way for me to constantly help people in some way where maybe I once a month try to have a three hour session with someone and we record that put that out there i'm not sure but that's another thing it's just these ways i want to try to somehow interact more with you my listeners and also to directly try to still help people in some way i can um yeah like those so those have actually been on my mind more and more and i guess that's that's the thing you know you, you have to constantly do things to find ideas and you know, ideas alone are worth nothing. It's all about execution. And definitely, you know, I have to execute on these ideas as well. But by executing, by doing the podcast, it also helps me generate more ideas that could work. And over time, when these ideas get stronger and I get a better conviction, then I end up executing on it. And I found out that's how I also operate as well. Some people are very fast decision makers, very fast executions and or executors not executors executors and that style works really well and i found a lot of entrepreneurs are like that especially the ones that get venture funding because they got to go really really fast i'm not necessarily that kind of person i don't think i am actually naturally like that my natural disposition is to take a long time to execute even when i make investments sometimes i look at investments for years until i pull the trigger and i really think and i always have it in my subconscious and I listen to partly my gut, but also base it with some data and facts. And when I have enough conviction, I do it. I pull the trigger. Like, 
Maybe that's why it took me so long to start a podcast. And, you know, part of me that feels that's very frustrating. I used to get very frustrated about that, upset that I was such a slow decision maker. But I think nowadays, it's also been a learning on realizing that that's just how I make decisions. And that's just my process. It's neither right or wrong. People might say it's wrong because everyone's so, uh, you know, gung-ho about people who can execute quickly and that's what Silicon Valley says and all these tech investors say so that must be the way but I really don't want to build a billion dollar company and I don't want any venture money either so (laughs) I don't think their rules apply to me and I think that's another thing I've definitely learned to learn to not take all the advice I started out not taking advice and then because I entered a field that I had no business being in and I wanted to be more open, I started taking everyone's advice. And now I'm kind of trying to st- stop and think and take less advice and only listen to the ones that apply for me, that I think apply for me, and then execute on that forefront. Um, yeah. That's definitely also been another learning as well. And I think if I think back on the big learnings I've had from people that I speak to, there are some trends. One particular trend is that it's great to have a plan. Just know it's not going to work out. <laughs> I think that's definitely key. I And I might have altered it to fit my definition, but that's what I pulled out from a lot of the episodes and the stories. It's to have a plan, but hold it gently, hold it lightly, be flexible, because it won't go as you plan. It just won't. And be aware that it won't. But have it, so that you know where to execute and have some kind of direction. And also know that people who find quick wins are very rare. It's a very It's like winning the lottery. Like I've had you know, some past guests like um, like Marie from Sampler. She sent one email and that one email turned into becoming an entrepreneur in residence at a venture capital f- fund in New York and that started her off into starting this now this startup world. But, you know, so, so some people could listen to me like, wow, this person just sent one email and they just got it and they got a job from that. But then there are other cases where people go through 10, 20 year journeys trying to figure it out like, you know, Aaron from Wattpad, he's now a movie movie producer, like movie director. But when he started out as a mechanical engineer, it didn't seem obvious. It took him 10 years down a very windy, weird journey to get to the place that he ultimately wanted to get to. Plenty of entrepreneurs that have been on the podcast talk about how they get rejected hundreds of times by investors. And you're pitching your life to them. And so, yeah, I think... That's been another learning where most people, it takes a long time to get to where they want to go. And a lot of, and I think the fun part is a lot of people that I interview are people that have what I consider to have made it. They haven't really made it. They're in the journey right now. They're in the struggle. And I find that to be very fascinating because they, like, I feel some kind of kinship with them because we're constantly just on the journey. They might be further ahead ahead than me. Some might not. But we're also running our own race. And sometimes some quick wins will happen. But at the same time, a lot of things will get destroyed. And so, yeah, I think that's it. It's so inevitable for people to only notice other people getting something really easily. Or making it look like it's easy. And they think, damn, I should... I can't believe I'm not a millionaire after five years. I must be stupid. But I think it's the people that actually survive in the long run. Like the ones that, you know, the companies don't blow up. They don't quit. It's the ones that end up finishing the race. It's the ones that don't quit after about 20, 30 years. They're the ones that I'll probably think are the ones that will make it. Um, and I think those people don't have time to care about pe- people around them that win stuff in the short term. Also, even if they see it, they empirically know. That, yeah, you could have a friend that wins the lottery. Like, I have friends who've hit the jackpot with stock options. 
but many of them will also say that they had no idea this would happen. No one does. And you can get jealous about it. And there are times, yeah, when I think, God damn, I wish that had happened to me. And then, but, you know, then it goes, what, so what would I be doing then? then? Let's say I had the money, would I not be doing what I'm doing now? The answer is, no, no, I'll probably be doing something similar. Maybe I'll have, you know, fancier coffees, fancier dinners, travel a little more. But ultimately, it wouldn't really change what I'm doing. So I think that's how I've been able to get over it. And a lot of my guests have different ways of getting over it themselves. But that's definitely been a big thing. Uh, those have, those two things, like knowing that your plan will never work <laughs> as you intended to. It'll work in some form or fashion. And the plenty of people get things quickly. But at the same time, they might have gotten one thing quickly, but it might take them a really long time to get the next thing. And it's just the idea of constantly... Striving to get it, not quitting, just running the race constantly. So yeah, this was a long chat. All right, I'm I'm pretty proud of myself. We only made an hour, um, but yeah. So it's been a fun year. I really enjoyed it, and you know the the initial goal was make it to six months. That's twenty six episodes. I hit it, and then the next goal was let's make it to a year, and I've hit it, and. Now I guess, yeah, like, let's make it another year. 104 episodes. So, that's to that. And hopefully with that, I can try to help more people. Um, people ask me, do I have a goal in listenership? And I don't. I would love to help millions of people. But it's not really about the number. It's always about the quality. If I can help, you know. Even if I only helped a thousand, if of the thousand, one person becomes a game-changing icon and this podcast has a big deal to do with it, then, you know, would I say I'm not successful because I didn't have a million listeners? No. That would not be the case. So, and, and that's another thing. I've learned that there's no point in having goals that you can't really control the outcome of, at, at, at least for me. Like I can, I can control having 104 episodes compared to having a million listeners, because that's just another step to earn trust and having to convince someone to care. But 104 episodes, that just means that I didn't quit. So yeah, I think if I had, if I had to have a goal, it'd just be 100, you know, 104. <laughs> that's the next milestone. But nowadays, it's not even that. It's just I just constantly do it. I have a bigger goal for what OMD Ventures could be, what I want it to be. But other than that giant dream for the podcast and all that, it's, it's always the same. Find ways to improve, find ways to help inspire more lives, help you know, all you high performers are listening to challenge the convention in some way, form, or fashion. And most of all, have fun, have more interesting conversations, meet more interesting people. And live an interesting life. And hopefully I find some way to financially sustain myself through all this. <laughs> that's also that's also learning. Um, but yeah. Alright. Thanks for tuning in. And hope to have you back next week. As we continue our scheduled programming. Of having more uh, guests and interviewees. Alright. Take care. All right, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope the story was inspiring to you. It, hopefully it also helped you expand your perspectives. Hopefully it also made you question the default path that you might have been going on or the default beliefs you might have had. And maybe now it'll make you even think about doing something about it, doing something different maybe, challenging yourself, being courageous. Who knows? But regardless, I'm really happy that you took some time out of your day to listen to this fantastic story with my guest and if you would like to somehow in some way contribute and help support the podcast and maybe even just be part of the community that i'm trying to build with the greater omd ventures platform really think about being a stakeholder in the platform and the quick way to do that is to 
go to my website oldmandan.com and go to the stakeholders page i believe it's oldmandan.com slash stakeholder and the link is also down below and that's how you can figure out how you can subscribe follow to get more updates on the free content but at the same time also donate and donate by actually just buying me a coffee that's just how i put it and you can buy me a coffee a month coffee a week or coffee every day of the year and think about it as the way that you know if you wanted to chat with me you might just bring me out for coffee and buy me a coffee or if you wanted to bring one of my guests out to chat you might buy them a coffee so i'm just think of it as i'm the service that's doing that for you so you can just pay me in coffees <laughs> don't worry uh everything will still be free it's just it would just really help if you would like to show your support this way so that i can use the coffee money to buy myself actual coffees and also to buy my guests actual coffees at and use the leftover money to actually grow the platform as well as even keep it operationally alive as well because it all this is, isn't really free and it does take a lot of time to build it as well as operate it and hopefully grow it further so your support would be amazing if you would like to contribute and so yeah just check out the website go to the stakeholders page and read the different kind of benefits you might even get as a stakeholder all right thank you